Hi, and welcome to a really, hopefully, a fun winter experience. Uh, celebrating winter and celebrating wines that are really uh, hearty, homey, and comforting. Um, these, I guess, would be if these were summer wines, or, or if this was summer, these wines would be like rosés and Sauvignon Blancs. Um, all those kind of wines that are crisp, refreshing, um, go with a warm summer day. These wines are the opposite. Uh, they really kind of help to take the chill off of a, uh, a cold winter day. And they uh, really um, speak to the cuisine and the foods uh, this time of the year, which into themselves are hearty um, and, and full bodied and uh, take a lot of time to savor and to enjoy. And these wines really, really, really speak uh, to the, the, the flavors of the season, uh, if you will. These selections that we have chosen for our tasting um, all hail from our Pick of the Vine selection. And if you're unaware of what the Pick of the Vine selection uh, is all about, they are uh, hand curated wines that we uh, select that are all under $15 a bottle. So, uh, especially this time of the year after the holidays, uh, where value is one of the keywords. These wines uh, really, really over-deliver. Uh, they're outstanding values, everyday wines, um, but we believe that you uh, don't need to spend uh, a lot to get a lot. And uh, all of these wines you'll find in the Pick of the Vine set, and they really represent some diversity of grapes, styles, countries, flavors, um, and, and they're delicious, by the way. So let's, uh, let's get started. And um, once again, we have our cheese pairings. Hopefully, uh, at home, you've been able to uh, at least get a few of these pairings uh, for this event or uh, previous events. And hopefully, you enjoy the pairings as much as you, as you do the wines. Um, in, in this case, we'll always do cheeses uh, with the wines, but certainly I recommend some um, other kinds of foods that would be great with these wines as well. Our first wine of the tasting comes from, uh, from our friends uh, just across the border uh, in Ontario, at, uh, or by Niagara on the Lake, and this is the Henry of Pelham Baco Noir. Um, beautiful, beautiful winery. We've featured some of their wines in the past, and uh, these, uh, the, these folks, uh, the Speck brothers that own Henry of Pelham, are really some of the leaders uh, in the, uh, the Ontario wine movement, and they make wines that are expressive, great values, and, and delicious. Baco Noir, the grape, is most likely unfamiliar to many, many, many of you. My job is to make that uh, a formality and, and make that a past tense because uh, Baco Noir is really something that you see more um, on the eastern part of North America, um, up into Canada, certainly um, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, um, all those northeastern um, grape growing states. Baco Noir is important for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it's very, very winter hardy, meaning that it can survive the brutally cold temperatures uh, a lot better than uh, some of the other red grapes uh, can and will, up until recently with uh, some climate change. But um, Baco Noir is what's known as a hybrid, and that means that it has parentage in, in native varietals, and the classic European varietals. So in this case, Baco Noir actually has some, some um, relative uh, character to Pinot Noir, but it's also then um, been spliced into Native American uh, rootstocks. So basically what happens, before I lose everybody and myself and start chasing my tail, um, a, a hybrid is they get Native American rootstock that is both winter hardy and also disease resistant, uh, primarily to a grape louse called phylloxera. The uh, European uh, grapevine is grafted onto that North American rootstock, and that is, becomes then a hybrid. So hopefully that makes some sense. What will make sense, I promise, is that the wine is, is really delicious. So when you get a, a good smell of this, it's just redolent of red berries. Uh, cranberries, this is, gosh, would have been a perfect uh, uh, holiday wine going back to Thanksgiving. Um, but there's a little bit of maybe tobacco, Add some spice with this. Um, it really, it, it just really, really jumps from the glass. It's very, very perfumey. Uh, maybe you'll notice the color is a little bit lighter, which speaks to that um, Pinot Noir heritage. Um, so let's give it a taste. And these wines are in order that I believe will um, be the best progression in order to taste these wines, meaning that uh, you don't want to have some big blockbuster wine, start off the tasting, and kill your palate for everything else to follow. So 
kind of these wines are ranked in terms of intensity of lightest to fuller bodied. So what you're hopefully seeing with this Henry Pell and Bacca Noir is that there's a great amount of ripe fruit, that, those red berry characters, but there's some really, really nice, uh, juicy, vibrant acidity. And that really speaks to the, uh, not just in, in Ontario or uh, anywhere else in the world, but where there are uh, cooler climates. Uh, cool climate grape growing means you're going to get higher acidity. Higher acidity means uh, it translates into your palate as something vibrant, um, something juicy, and uh, really the backbone of the wine. Really, really fun stuff. The cheese we have, uh, this is something that's brand new in our stores, and uh, I will bet a, a bottom dollar, Canadian of course, because it's uh, not, as, uh, not as expensive as American if I lose that bet, but I would bet that bottom Canadian dollar that many of you have never had a cheese like this, and it's a smoked, sheep's milk cheese from England. Um, sheep's milk, again, not going down a, uh, a geeky rabbit hole, sheep's milk is different from cow's milk in, in a lot of ways, but what you need to know about uh, sheep versus cow is that sheep's milk is a little bit tangier than cow's milk, a little bit uh, less fat. So the thought was that tangy kind of character of this cheese, a sheep's milk cheese, with that kind of ta uh, uh, tangy character of the Henry Pelham would be a great, uh, a great, great uh, counterbalance of pairing along with some smoke flavor. So let's give that a taste. Mm. It really is bright. The oak smoke that is in there is subtle, but you know it's there. It kind of uh, has a, the mouthfeel of a cheddar, but really, like I say, bright, great acidity, and um, it's just yummy. If you like smoke, the smoke food, that's a cheese for you. So let's see if that uh, tartness of the cheese or that, that, that vibrant acidity of the cheese does the same thing with the wine or is, is um, similar to. And yes, <laughs> um, really, really, really fun. Great little pairing. The cheese uh, accentuates those red berry notes um, even more so. But I will always say the key to a perfect pairing is balance. You don't want one flavor of a food or the flavor of the wine to overwhelm either or, or, or both. You want the two items to create a synergy of flavors that are balanced as the wine uh, itself should be. That's really, really fun. Uh, hope you enjoy your first maybe experience with not just Bacqua Noir, but with a, uh, a sheep's milk cheese. Next up we have, um, if there were to be something that is, like, would be and actually is called California's grape that is Zinfandel, red Zinfandel. And therein lies the uh, uh, the million dollar issue with, with Zinfandel that uh, what really still today, some almost 40 years later, what has really um, catapulted Zinfandel into uh, uh, the spotlight was back in the 80s when white Zinfandel was made. And white Zinfandel is essentially uh, Zinfandel rose. But the, the marketing folks at Sutter Home that really uh, uh, were the uh, leaders of the white Zin movement really, really got it out there. And uh, just like a rosé is made, Zinfandel is a red-skinned, white-fruited grape, meaning that when the grapes are picked, if there's just a little bit of skin contact uh, from between the skins and the, and the juice, you'll get a, a little bit of a rosé or a blush of color, thus the term blush wines. So the neat thing about Zinfandel um, today and even then was that all the vineyards and Zinfandel was uh, at, a, at a time the most widely planted red grape in California. It's what the Italian immigrants really uh, loved and planted in some really, really hot uh, climates um, in, in uh, northern Napa and into the uh, Alexander Valley and uh, Russian River and uh, a lot of these, these uh, warm sites in Sonoma, uh, over to Lodi, down south into Costa, uh, Contra Costa County. Um, it was everywhere. So these old vine vineyards that were historic were really kind of being, I guess, neutered in a little bit uh, by, uh, by making of white Zinfandel because a white Zin really doesn't have um, a lot of the same characters of the red wine. Um, so it really, what it did though, preserved a lot of those vineyards that, be, that would have been torn out because Cabernet was, uh, was gaining in popularity. Merlot, believe it or not, if you're old enough to remember, was a real popular red wine. And if it wasn't for the creation of white Zinfandel, those Zinfandel uh, vines would have been uh, gone and lost forever. So the good news, though, is that um, they're still there. The interesting thing, though, is and you could ask yourself, ask a friend, ask your neighbor, open your window and say, hey, do you want a glass of Zinfandel? 
And I would bet you, again, maybe another bottom dollar, that they're going to think of the pink equivalent of, of uh, Zinfandel, the white Zen. That's been the blessing and the curse because most people still, uh, when they think of Zen, they think it's going to be pink. And that kind of little misunderstanding and misconception has really what has uh, led Zen, red Zen, to uh, being and maintaining itself as one of the really extreme red wine values in California because people don't really get it. Those that do, though, the enlightened people, really understand what Zin is all about. It's a generous, sp spicy, um, there's a lot of um, kind of brambly fruit, um, and always with a spice like black pepper. Uh, it's unmistakably Zinfandel. And um, if you like red wine, you're going to like red Zin. Um, it, it really bears no resemblance to its pink or white quote unquote cousin. Um, but Zinfandel really um, it was a, is a grape that is really uh, not indigenous to California. There's a lot of debate as to exactly uh, where it came from and what its name could have been in the old world. Uh, some people think it's Primitivo from Italy. Uh, there are some people that think it could be from the vineyards, uh, ancient vineyards of Yugoslavia. The bottom line though is it's called Zinfandel nowhere else in the world but California and other parts now of the West Coast, making it, as I said earlier, kind of California's grape. Let's give it a taste. Really, really generous, really, really ripe. A lot of ripe fruit forward flavors. Um, a little bit of chocolatey notes in there. Um, again, if you like red wine, you're going to like Zen. It, it's that simple. Um, just don't tell everybody because if Zen gets really popular, uh, it'll get more expensive. So um, if we can uh, keep this as our little secret uh, about um, the, the Zinfandel value, you'll never be disappointed. The cheese pairing we have with this is uh, a new cheese to our stores. Um, it's from uh, it's the Heinz branded Isle of Man cheddar. And essentially what this will mimic is, and kind of is, is like a farmhouse cheddar, meaning it'll have some earthy notes to it, some grassy uh, flavors, a lot of complexity. Um, it's a cheddar lover's cheddar. Say that five times fast. It's also one that if you just like cheese, you're gonna like it, but it, it is very, very true to its um, English roots. So let's try that. Mm, real dense. There's a nice balance of saltiness and cr uh, like almost sweet cream uh, flavors to it. Mouth-watering, like a good cheddar should be, which should make your mouth water. And probably you shouldn't talk when you're chewing it like I'm doing because it does pose a bit of a problem, but it's delicious. Well, let's try this with the Zin. Yeah. Mm. It's like ripeness and ripeness. Um, just a fun, um, fun wine to have with a lot of things that are just fun and easy foods. Zinfandel and pizza, classic. You can't, you can't go wrong. Um, but if you want to do something a bit more elevated, um, and actually, uh, in California, uh, primarily in Sonoma, um, lamb is a major, 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 uh, uh, meat out there and very popular. And, uh, to do a, a lamb shoulder, so you could smoke it, you could braise it, but lamb and zin with uh, a good amount of black pepper and maybe some fresh rosemary, killer. Um, you'll think you're, well, you know, California dreaming on a winter day with, uh, with uh, the California grape and some lamb. Really, really excellent. Now we're going to move to Italy. And this is a fun uh, wine in that it's, it's made uh, a bit unique or uniquely um, but it tastes delicious and it's unmistakably Italian. Um, it's a Valpolicella. You may have heard of that, but the key that, that makes this one kind of fun and funky is it, it's made in a Rapasso style. And again, uh, not going down a geek rabbit hole, but um, basically this is a wine that is created from the, the um, I would say, the classic grapes of the region or the indigenous grapes of the region, um, Corvinia, Rondinella, and um, Molinara. Yeah, very Italian grapes. So those three grapes are used to make Valpolicella. The Rapasso technique involves getting pumice, grape pumice, and essentially what that is, is it's the, pre, uh, the pressed skins and seeds of the, the, the byproduct of uh, when wine is being made. So it's all the skins, uh, skins seeds, and non-juice um, non components that are now into the wine. So this essentially sediment uh, from Amarone. Amarone is the higher level of uh, uh, wines from uh, up in Piedmont and Verona, where these wines are from. So that pumice, those skins and seeds, 
are added into the, the uh, fermenting uh, Valpolicella grapes. And that pumice from the Amarone grapes adds a, a, a complexity, uh, a richness, a savoriness. Uh, it's unlike anything else. And that technique was done um, a long time ago to increase the complexity of the wines and increase the ripeness uh, and flavors because uh, up in northern Italy, they can have um, uh, issues sometimes with the ripeness because if it's too cool, uh, that was used to kind of um, uh, ensure that the, the wines would, would be palatable. The technique has stayed along and, and uh, has never gone away and it creates just a really unique, distinctly Italian red wine experience. So when you smell it, well, if you're an Italian wine fan, you're going to say to yourself, as I'm thinking to myself, it smells Italian. What that means, if you're not an Italian wine fan or aren't as familiar with wines like that, there's, there's a, a, like a dark cherry character. But um, again, whereas this is kind of cool climate grape growing again, you can't smell acid, but you can smell um, vibrancy. You can smell um, grapes that are not overripe. Uh, they, they smell fresh of grapes versus overripe and pruney. Uh, there's a, a richness and, and vibrancy there that is really pretty. It's kind of spicy and um, aromatic and perfumey. Maybe some violets. Let's give it a taste. It's, um, it's amazing how much flavor there is, but how crisp it is too, how, how vibrant that acidity is. And hopefully you're getting that. Um, it really, really, really um, is bright and invites another sip. And, you know, obviously, um, it would be superb with any red sauce or roasted meat Italian creation you'd want to come up with. Um, certainly, you can't over garlic this. Um, I wouldn't go too crazy in the spices. But with tomato-based sauces, one of the reasons that Italian wines work so well with uh, Italian cuisine with red sauce is you think about the acidity that's in the tomato. The, the acid, the acidity in the wine balances out the, the acidity in the tomato and um, it really works well and pairs well together. Um, the old saying is what, uh, what grows together goes together. That's a classic example. So whereas we uh, don't have a big pot of uh, uh, red sauce going today, uh, we do have something that is Italian in its heritage. And this is a, a brand new item for us at Heinen's. It's a gorgonzola uh, cheese spread. Uh, it's actually uh, produced in Philadelphia and sent to our stores. Gorgonzola uh, is, of course, one of the great cheeses of the world, but it's really the, um, um, the epitome of Italian blue cheese. It's creamy and sweet and yummy and runny. Uh, this is actually blended with a little bit of cheddar, so you're going to get all those kind of wonderful blue cheese flavors, but not overdone. So let's, um, and on a handy dandy Triscuit, uh, let's give it a taste. It's blue, but as I said, not over the top. And with any cheese, and certainly the cheese spread, you want to pull these out of the fridge maybe half an hour, half an hour before you want to use them. Um, when, just like any wine or any food, when it's too cold, it'll, it'll uh, dull your taste buds and you won't get the full flavors. So especially with that spread, you want it to be smooth and creamy um, out of the fridge for that extra time. So let's see if that kind of pungent, um, blue cheese character brings out a little bit more uh, fruit flavors of the wine. Mm. Yeah, um, it, it, it brings out a depth of character that's not there on its own. Um, and sometimes with acidity, the, the, the backbone needs that foil, that counterpart, um, to really show its true self. And in this case with that wine, that gorgonzola spread, the flavors really meld together. They create longer, um, more profound, and um, I guess complex flavors. So just absolutely fun. You can't go wrong with this. Um, again, any night you just want to have a pizza or do something a bit more evolved uh, that's Italian-influenced, that's a really, really superb choice. Now we move along to our final wine of the tasting this evening. Um, and very honestly, when... Our wine teams were considering what wines to, uh, uh, to showcase in this tasting and um, call them winter wines. Um, this was going to be in, period, because it's a unique wine, it's a fun wine, and it's a wine that needs to be discovered because it doesn't get uh, the recognition. It makes Zinfandel <laughs> in terms of relevancy and, and um, being understood. Petit Syrah makes Zin seem like Cabernet. 
because uh, most people have hardly uh, don't really understand what uh, red zin could be. Really, petite sera is um, a, a, uh, a hidden treasure. It's neither petite nor sera, ironically enough. Um, it, it's called petite sera, and that's its its new world name. Um, but by and large, and, and it's considered to be a grape uh, known in France as Durif. And that's um, something that is used um, along the Mediterranean coast. And uh, it really just is a blending grape there. But when it was brought to California, primarily by um, European settlers in the 1800s, it did really, really well there. It was hardy, it, it, uh, it produced in abundance, and it became a very, very major grape uh, for the early settlers in California. The Concanon family um, started their winery in the 1880s. And it's still going strong in the Livermore Valley. Um, if you've not been to the Livermore Valley in California, you gotta go. It, it doesn't have the hustle and bustle of Napa or Sonoma, but it is. Uh, there's some great foods, historic wineries. Livermore is kind of um, it's it's near San Jose. This, for lack of a better uh, description, it's the East Bay of the San Pablo Bay or San Francisco Bay, and um, the there are legendary historic wineries down there and Concanon is one of them. And Concanon is really the, uh, the godfathers of Petit Sera in California. Uh, they've been there longer than anybody. They uh, released the first labeled Petit Sera in the early 60s, and um, they continue just to make a, a, a amazing wine. I believe, pound for pound, that a wine with this kind of story, this kind of history, You'll see with the flavors and quality, it is just one of the great red values we have in our stores uh, and it's certainly in our Pick of the Vine set. So I hope you get a chance to see the color in this wine. Um, no, I'm not going to do it, but I really, <laughs> I thought that it's almost as dark as ink. And if you want to try it at home, dip your finger in and try to write your name. It, it'll stain not just a piece of paper, but when you and some guests or just family, um, have some petite sirah, and if you, the whole bottle is, uh, is enjoyed, you will notice a nice purple hue on your teeth afterwards. Uh, it does stain your teeth uh, pretty nicely. It does brush off, but you'll know you've had petite sirah after, you, uh, after you've had it because it really, that, that, that amazing purple color really translates uh, into, into some um, after effects. So let's give it a smell. Mm. Blackberries. Blackberries and fresh ground pepper. That's not what the wine smells like. I was just thinking about those things. No, seriously. Yes, blackberries and fresh ground pepper are what the wine smells like. Um, Petite Syrah is, is also really brooding. There's maybe some leather in there. Some, uh, some The French call it sauvage. Some animal notes, meaning like just, it smells like the earth and in a, in a, in a, like in a, being in a barn. Um, and that probably sounds gross, but it really is pleasingly funky. Now, when you taste it, now, let's agree, I think, and I hope, that aromatically it, it pretends to be a lot of wine and a lot of flavors and a lot of richness. Let's taste it. Boy, hopefully you'll see that ripeness goes right through your palate. It, it sets the stage for the tannins that are now following, tannins being that chewy, um, backbone of the wine, you know, when you just are eating table grapes and you're chewing the skins, that's tannic acid, you get that in abundance. What's key though is with all that richness of the grape flavors and all those big tannins, they balance each other out. You've got big going against big, creating balance. It doesn't taste like anything else. Um, it is really um, a wine that seems to be the reason braising was invented. Um, and, and honestly, uh, Petit Syrah with something hot off the grill during the summertime, or if we get a, 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 a temperate winter day, um, smoked meats, smoked beef, uh, tri-tip out in California primarily uh, is great, but braised uh, hearty meats, um, you know, braised pork shoulder would be unbelievable. Um, it is just a wine that is hearty. It, it defines a comfort winter wine. Um, and if you've never tried it and are discovering it today for the first time, I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are in sharing it with you. Our last cheese pairing is a, uh, a, a, a mountain style cheese. Mountain meaning uh, cheese like Gruyere, Emmentaler, all those uh, Swiss, Austrian um, cheeses up in the Alps. Um, it's called Ramtaler. And Ramtaler 
It feels like Gruyere. It kind of smells like Gruyere, but mm. it's Gruyere's bigger, more muscular cousin. Um, so much flavor. Mouth mouthwatering again, providing a challenge to talk while, while I'm chewing it. But um, it's earthier than Gruyere. It um, you can almost taste the grasses from from where the milk was cold. And that's where earthiness is, I think, a really kind of a cool description. You can really, really get that grassy fields of meadows from the milk. And just uh, tart and savory and salty. Really, really a lot of flavor. And let's see what happens when big goes with big. Mm. Well, as I said before with the blackberries, Blackberries are just jumping out of the glass now when you have a really, really intense, either in this case, cheese pairing or with a food pairing. You really see how the tannins are mitigated by all the flavors of the food. And what you're left with is that beautiful, ripe blackberry um, notes that are just perfect. They, they, uh, they're fun, they're enjoyable, and they invite another sip. So that's a great way to discover Petite Syrah. So again, these are all wines that you can find in our Pick of the Vine set. Um, all under $15 a bottle, all representing um, a story, um, quality, and really, really versatile uh, with, with any kind of winter kind of cuisine that you would like to uh, serve uh, on any day of the week. And they are really, really exceptional, and we hope you enjoy them, and uh, hope you enjoy tasting them, and um, look forward to your comments. Uh, we'll see you next month for our February tasting, where uh, a little spoiler alert, um, don't forget Valentine's Day is in February, and uh, it's a great opportunity to find some great wines, and we will be bringing those to you um, again next month. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoy them. Cheers. Cheers.